Warning. Listener discretion is advised. Ah, son of a bitch, that was hot. Okay, so today I was going to talk about mental health and childhood trauma and abuse, but I feel like that episode would be three hours long, (laughs) and I know that y'all are busy people, and y'all probably have a lot of work to do today, so instead I'm just going to talk about mental health and how my mental health has affected relationships as an adult, and then in a later episode we can talk about my own personal abuse and trauma and how that affected my mental health the way I connect with people, and my overall mistrust of people as I'm getting to know them. But first, let me pay some bills. Okay, so my journey with mental health is a really long and winding and rocky journey from about the age of six or seven to now, actually. And... If you ask my mother, she will tell you that she noticed early on that I wasn't like other children. But when I tell that to other people, they understand my mother's feelings to be the anxieties of raising your first child. Now, in whatever way early on the symptoms manifested themselves towards me being a difficult child, or hyperactive, or unmanageable, whether those things were completely abnormal, or my mother, with her first child to raise, didn't know how to accept that as the traits of a child, an average child. So, growing up, there was always this argument about whether or not I was really ADHD, because at about seven or eight, I was diagnosed with being ADHD, and I was put on medication, and Because my parents were never really together, the only time I saw them arguing with each other was about whether or not they thought I was really ADHD or not. My dad thought I was just a shitty kid, and I needed to be disciplined, and I needed to be knocked around a little bit, but I didn't need medication. I was just going through the normal antics that an average child goes through. And my mother knew that there was something hyperactive and special or different about me and my brain and how it worked compared to the other kids. Because, in fairness to my mother, she was around a good amount of children before I was a part of her life. So I knew that she would know whether I was abnormal or not. Part of me always said that the reason she put me on medication was so that I would be easier to handle, and... In retrospect, and in hindsight, I can't really blame her sometimes because she was a single parent, and I'm sure having a kid on medication would be easier to manage and deal with after you come home from working a 13-hour shift or working two individual shifts at your two jobs. So, at about seven or eight, I get put on Adderall and my through my elementary years and through my junior high years the doses that it takes for the medication to become effective begin to slowly increase it starts to take more and more Adderall for me to get my shit together (laughs) and it was starting to take more and more of the night medication they prescribed me to counteract the Adderall it started to take more and more of that to put me to sleep. And now, when it comes to Adderall, which is a stimulant for people like me with ADHD, it helps and allows us to concentrate. It allows us to center ourselves. And it does so chemically, so that way we can focus. In people who do not have ADHD, Adderall is very similar to meth (laughs) or speed Or whatever that drug is that makes people, you know, hyper, hyperactive. (laughs) Which is another reason that ADHD individuals use coffee to calm down. Because caffeine did something similar to the Adderall. And it allowed our brain activity to speed up so that we could focus and clear our thoughts. And really put our mind to the task at hand. So at about the time I get to junior high, I notice that I have some 
anger management issues because, of course, having gone through what I went through, I was mad all the time. I was mad at my mother. I was mad at my dad. I was mad at everybody. I was mad at anyone who didn't understand. And I was mad at myself for not being able to tell people without the fear of shame and pity what was going on in my life so that I could get the help that I needed. My mother could get the help that she needed so that we would, you know, come out of the situation mentally healthy. And I knew that the anger I would feel sometimes, my willingness to pop off at a moment's notice, my willingness to allow my blood to boil so quickly when confronted with even the slightest inconvenience wasn't something that I saw or observed in other people regularly. So I began to notice this anger issue and the abnormality of that anger issue at about, I would say about junior high, because I was a teenager. Being a teenager is hard enough. And then to have mental illness stacked on top of it and to have uh, a difficult home life, the teenage years weren't the best for me, as you will find out. That anger problem and my inability to control it develops later into a kind of bipolar depression. And although I was never diagnosed as bipolar or with some sort of specific anger issue, it is something that I have lived with since about junior high because I will go into uncontrollable rages for absolutely no reason. And it's the manic depression cycle that from the outside looking in is what people attribute me being entertaining to and from the inside out can really be mentally and emotionally draining i have cycles of being a light for people and a rainbow in other people's cloud and (laughs) being the cloud (laughs) being the thunderstorm that people flee the city from And I can both be a very kind and loving and gentle person, very understanding, and I can be a shitty asshole motherfucker that will shit on your whole life, drop a house on you, and sleep like a baby. It's very much so attributed to the fact that I unconfirmedly have been bipolar since about junior high. Now, my mother never really had the money to get me back to a psychiatrist to diagnose that. And now that I'm an adult, I fear getting diagnosed because of what it could do for me socially, medically, and and lifestyle-wise. But that is another thing I, I regularly hassle with, is the highs and lows of just existing. Whenever I'm sad, I'm not just, you know, disappointed and inconvenienced with sadness. I am stricken with grief. The world is ending, and I want to jump off a building... And non-existent sounds like a sweet relief. And when I'm happy, my heart is the sun. And when I'm trying to make people laugh or be funny, and I'm one of the funniest people you'll ever meet, but it switches so easily for me on a dime. And I've come to notice that it normally does that depending on the social situation. So, of course, my, my white girlfriends have told me that it has something to do with the fact that I'm a Gemini. Which, if you also follow astrology, I don't know, one of those. One of them's a science and one of them's white girl shit. If you follow astrology, everything I just said probably makes a shit ton of sense to you. (laughs) Because it does for everyone else. (laughs) But yeah, I dealt with that for the longest time. To this day, sometimes, I will have really good days and really dark days. But one of the most defining mental illness issues that I had growing up was definitely a clinical depression. It was crippling, it was very chemical, and it was debilitating in a way. It's hard to understand and sympathize with someone with a mental illness because mental illness isn't something that someone without a mental illness can so easily associate or connect an emotion with, or a feeling with, or an experience with. Having a mental illness is very unique, amongst mentally ill people especially, because one mentally ill person isn't mentally ill in the same way another person with the same mental illness might be. So I noticed the development of clinical depression at about 15. 
And it was really tough for me because I was a sophomore in high school. I was in love with someone that I knew I couldn't have a relationship with because of the dynamics of being a high schooler and a gay high schooler in Bible Belt, Texas, in a small town with with three people in a gas station. And something about my circumstances really just depressed me. And I can't say that it wasn't at all environmental because I know that things might not have been so difficult or things might have been easier for me had I not been in this little town and had I been surrounded by people that were like me or were open to associating themselves with me because of who I was. But I also know, based on a doctor's analysis, that it was a chemical it was a chemical anomaly in my brain. My brain just decided it wasn't going to create serotonin that day, and I was going to be depressed. (laughs) It's very much like that meme you see on Facebook going around that says, We gonna be sad today! (laughs) That was my depression in high school. And at about 16, I tried to kill myself. I remember the day like it was yesterday, but I don't remember much afterward. Because me and my mother had been arguing that day. In a very sadistic way, I wanted her, I wanted to win the fight because to this day, I will tell you, I do not argue with someone unless I know I'm right. And you know, I am mentally ill if I am so determined to be correct and to win an argument with someone that I will risk killing myself to show it. But I tied a a shirt around my neck in bed and tried to suffocate myself. And I remember laying in bed for like half a second and thinking to myself, this is it. I'm going to show her. And then I remember my mother smacking me around and telling me to breathe. And then I finally took my breath. And then I don't remember anything after that. I think my brain, as a method of survival, just kind of blacked out the next few hours. But I do remember the next morning my mother waking me up very kindly and saying, I'm going to take you to school today, which was kind of odd to me, but not, you know, out of this world to where I would immediately know something was wrong. I remember my mother saying, I'm going to take you to school today. Go ahead and get ready. Normally, my mother taking me to school was an argument (laughs) because I used to tell my mother because I didn't like riding the bus to school because for whatever reason, when you show up to school on a bus, the other kids think you are low income. And although I was low income, the other kids didn't need to know that. I didn't want them to know my home circumstances. I didn't want them to judge me. So I hated riding the bus. And I used to tell my mother, I used to miss the bus on purpose. And I would tell my mother, if you don't take me to school, I'm not going. I'm not going. So my mother, every morning, within an argument with me, she would get her shit together, make me get my shit together, and she would very angrily take me to school. And so, you know, every morning I had to ride to school, but it was always a, it was always a fight. But this morning in particular, she said, I'm going to take you to school today. And I was like, all right, sounds good. And I let her take me to school. But, um, you know, we got in the car. I, I put my backpack by my feet and she moved my backpack into the back seat and said, you won't need that. And immediately I knew what was going on. And, I kind of hoped in a way that she wouldn't do what I thought she was going to do, but I also knew that I needed it in a way. And we started driving. And we missed every turn on the way to school. And in the last turn before leaving town, my mother, through tears, said, I know that between us, we don't have a perfect relationship, but I can't lose you. So she got on the highway, and we started driving 45 minutes to the biggest city nearby, which is Amarillo, Texas. And we pulled into Northwest Hospital, where it's called Northwest Hospital Mental Rehab Facility, whatever. But everyone around here calls it the Pavilion. And uh, my mother put me in a, a mental health rehab center. 
and I remember before we walked inside, we were in the car, she turned it off, and she told me, if you don't want to go in there, I don't, I don't blame you, and I'll, 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 we can turn around and go back to town, and you can go to school, and we can just pretend this didn't happen or whatever, because being raised Hispanic, well, at least she was anyway, mental illness was an entirely new frontier. It was the deepest part of the ocean and the dark side of the moon, and she didn't really know what to do. But she knew that there was a place nearby that could help me, and if I was willing to be helped, I could walk into that building and she would be there for me if I chose therapy and mental rehabilitation and mental health. And of course, my mother's an emotional person, and that's where I get my kind heart from, because she really is just a big old crybaby. Love her to death. Oh my God. She annoys the hell out of me, though, sometimes. <laughs> but she really is the kindest person. She can be a bitch sometimes, but she likes being called a bitch, so don't think I'm calling my mama a bitch. She has cups everywhere that say queen bitch on it. So, <laughs> very much like me, she has a very nice streak and a really bitchy streak, and she takes pride in both. <laughs> Anyway, I remember walking into the treatment facility like I was Dorothy opening the dark black and white house into Oz. And I remember in a very melodramatic way thinking, this is my, this is my girl interrupted moment. This is, <laughs> this is my Alice in Wonderland moment. This is my Dorothy and Oz moment. I'm Susanna Kaysen. That really was what being in the mental facility was to me. And... The average person is there for three days because it's kind of a catch and release program. They scoop you up when you're at your, your darkest and your deepest. They make sure you don't want to kill yourself anymore. And then they throw you back into the world. <laughs> and the average person is there for about three to five days. And I was there for two weeks. It was a really bad time for me. The most ironic thing happened is that I, I formed friendships with people that I've sustained to this day. There are two girls in particular that I'd met there that I still either have conversations with or know to be close by through Facebook and, you know, could message at a moment's notice. And, of course, while I was there, there were two other people from my, my own school, my own class, my own grade, who I suppose had also had bouts of mental health or mental health lapses and ended up in the same place I was. And those people, though we don't talk every day, I know that I always find support for them in my heart, if that makes sense. I always hope that they're doing well, and whenever I see them out and about in passing, I always think to myself, good for them, because we made it. We're still going, we're still pushing, we're still trying, we're still striving for life. You know, every day for someone with mental illness and depression, it's a battle between taking our life or letting life take us on a journey. I think now that my, my mental health issues were brought on by my really weird, obscure upbringing, the social dynamics of my family, the family dynamics of my upbringing, and how that just kind of influenced me to not really be the most mentally healthy person because I didn't have the most firm, stable childhood. The biggest chunk of my childhood was I served as the rope in a perpetual game of tug and war between my, my parents and, you know, one semester I would live in Abilene, one semester I would live in Hereford and repeat and repeat and repeat summers with my dad, school with my mother. Some years my dad was in prison, so I stayed in Hereford, or I went to Abilene with my grandparents. I know that my mental health issues were brought on from my rocky childhood because when you don't have one place to call home, or you don't have a regular structure and even foundation that doesn't move under you when you take steps into this world, isn't 
everything that you build on top of that platform isn't really fated to succeed or to be completely healthy or to have a clean, solid, healthy nature. I know that the external chaos of my childhood influenced the internal chaos of my mind and like a sponge in the way that some kids' minds are programmed to be, I just began to soak up that instability. I began to soak up all of those mentally and emotionally unhealthy habits that I picked up from the people around me. And and in the way that you can be very mature as a mentally ill person at an early age, I kind of knew that I was jacked up. And I knew that I wouldn't be able to do anything about it on my own. And consciously, I knew that my mother probably wouldn't be able to afford the help for me. And I'd just kind of given up because I thought, you know, if this is what my life is like at 16, and these are the best and easiest years of my life, the rest of my life is going to be bullshit. And I might as well just fold my hand here. I didn't want to play the next round or the next game, what other plays life had for me, because I was done at that moment. I'd been through a lifetime's worth of distress and sadness and grief and depression and abuse in 16 years, and I told myself I was done with it. And now I think that all of the things that I went through as a child are the reason that as an adult, I try my very best <laughs> to be a light for people and to be a beacon of hope for people and to be the source of a smile or kindness or whatever it might take to get them through that one day because if I could stop one heart from breaking or one mind the aching I wouldn't have lived that day and I wouldn't have regretted waking up that day and decided for me that my struggle wasn't going to be in vain. Whenever I was 18 years old, I decided to completely stop taking medication, which was both the best and the worst thing I could do for myself at the time because I was still going through active bouts of depression. But I also knew that I didn't want to be beholden to medicines and artificial chemicals for the rest of my life in order to just have a gray day. And so I told myself, self, we are going to figure it out. We have been on medication for 10 years. This medication has kept us going. We haven't lived a life. We haven't felt the joy or the bliss that one normally does when they've been sun-kissed in the morning or felt a raindrop on their nose and the medications had made me a zombie to that point i wasn't able to remain inspired when i was on medication and the good times and the bad times just kind of felt numb so i decided that with joy comes pain and with struggle comes triumph and i was going to try and make it on my own without medication and if i failed i failed <laughs> And the Lord would put me back on earth in someone else's body. And, you know, I would get another chance at this. But if I succeeded, I knew that I was going to take it all the way. And I was going to keep going. And I was going to be a success. I was going to be somebody. I was going to share my story. Because there was some kid out there in God knows what state, in the Bible Belt, with a single mother, who wasn't financially everywhere they needed to be because of their absent father and had mental health issues and has mental health issues whose mother can't really afford treatment and whose hope is lost and if in a way i could make that kid's battle one percent easier because i exist it wasn't a bad day after all my mental illness has affected my relationships because it's hard to love someone for who they are if they're always trying to be someone else so that you'll love them. And it's also kind of impossible to build a relationship with someone who 
is dealing with the echoes and the remnants of childhood traumas and abuses that he never really addressed. Growing up, I always tried to be good enough for my dad to deserve my dad's love and attention. And I think it made me a try hard. It really made me someone who was willing to do whatever it took to get someone to like me, to love me. I'd say whatever I needed to. I'd do whatever I needed to. I'd bend over backwards, sideways, front ways, and break every bone in my body. If for a second I was someone that deserved a smile or some attention or a thought or someone who deserved to exist in the same room space as them without being hit or abused mentally, emotionally, psychologically, physically, etc. And so when it came to relationships, I tried to be everything that I needed to be authentically. I tried to be everything that I needed to be for them. I tried to do all of the things that the perfect guy would do. And when my relationships were great, they were great. But whenever my relationships started to show just a sign of weakness or perhaps a sign that they might be just like every other relationship and have their ups and their downs, I had decided it was because I wasn't doing enough and it was all my fault and I wasn't good enough and I wasn't this enough and I wasn't that enough and I would sabotage my own relationships by getting ahead of myself by allowing my anxiety to tell me that I wasn't good enough. When you're dating, you don't want to be with someone who's working against themselves to love you. And that's what I was doing. And it really was completely because as a child, and it really was completely because as a child, my number one goal was to just get people to love me because I wasn't getting enough of it. I wasn't getting the amount of affection and love and attention that you would really need to be a functioning person in society without mental health issues. <laughs> so whenever my anxiety whispered to me that, that you're not good enough for him, I started to do my relationship by moving away, by moving away from him, by distancing myself from him, by telling him that if he wanted to exist here, or if he wanted to exist over there, somewhere he knew I couldn't be, that he wasn't ready to love me, and so I let him go. And in my poetry, in the second book, I talk about how I ruined the relationship by not thinking I was good enough, and by thinking he was too good for me. And in my second book, which is the book that I wrote mostly about this relationship in particular. I go through the process and the steps of grief. I go through being shocked and in denial and sad and mad. I was so mad at him because I kept telling myself, why would you want to be in this other city where you knew I couldn't be? Am I not good enough for you? And then when I told myself it was because I wasn't good enough for him, I tried to be something I wasn't, and I tried harder, and I pushed him away in a way to protect myself, or, you know, I told, I bro I'd break up with him because if I wasn't everything that you needed, and if I wasn't the one thing that you couldn't stand to lose, what was the point of me being here? What was the point of me being here? And we'd only been together, <laughs> the first time we'd broken up, we'd only been together for about three, four months. Which, at that point, was the longest relationship I'd ever really been in, except the girl before him. But me and her were never really in a relationship. But to me, if you go on dates with someone, you're dating. So I dated her off and on while, while we were in college for like a year and a half. But, you know, we had like four, five, six dates. And, you know, she'd spend some time at my house and I would, we, we'd talk or text or snap every day. And then for large periods of time, we wouldn't communicate with each other. And then we would and we wouldn't. And we were young. It's really hard for me to date women because of my, because of my, my personality. <laughs> it's very much gay. <laughs> 
but in the specific instances of those relationships where my mental illness affected them, it was that my anxiety told me I wasn't good enough for them because I'd never really been good enough for anybody. At least that's what I thought. <sighs> I just laid a lot of stuff on y'all's lap. <laughs> I am going to cut this episode right here. We can carry on this conversation in the next episode or pick up where we left off in a future episode because it's another conversation that I feel might give you even more insight into what's going on in my head and the identity issues that I faced and still face to this day. With that being said, I think it's time to record our very first Let Me Explain. Today I'm going to explain the difference between sex and gender. Now I'm going to read this from the dictionary so no one can argue with me. Sex is either of the two main categories, male and female, into which humans and many other living things are divided on the basis of their reproductive functions. And the definition of gender is the state of expressing being male or female, typically used with reference to social and cultural differences rather than biological ones. Now, that gets tricky for some of you who don't know how to read, so I'm going to explain it for you. Sex is biology. Sex is science. There are males and females. Females have uteruses and vaginas and ovaries. Males have penises, testicles, and sperm. Scientific. It's very biological. Those are the facts. It's very written in stone. It's genetic. It is enthrived in your DNA. Every fiber of your being is created with the denomination of your sex. So every skin cell that falls off of you carries with it the information to which categorizes you as male or female. Now, gender is how you express being male or female. Now, expression is a very difficult word for some of you, and that's okay. That's what mama's here for. I'm going to teach you, so that way you don't look stupid on Facebook when you post about how there are only two genders, and you don't want your kids learning about this stuff in school, and that if you're really a woman, how about you get pregnant? If your sex is biological and your gender is an expression, that means you can express your genetic limit however you feel necessary, fitting, or delightful. That means that biological males can express themselves and identify themselves as females if they so fit. Being transgender can also mean a female who expresses themselves as a man or identifies as a man and wishes to live their life as so. Now, there's 50 million genders, and I haven't even bothered to learn all of them, <laughs> to be completely honest. But I know that there's transgender, there's transsexual, there's non-binary, gender neutral, agender, there's all of these other genders. And that is okay and that makes sense and that is legitimate because there are so many ways to express the fact that you have a penis or a vagina. So if I confused you, I'm going to say it again. Sex is biological. It's genetic. It's male or female. Plain and simple. Gender is how you express being male or female according to social norms and social constructs. So, Gender is how you feel, and sex is what you are. Now, some words of advice. Do not call a transgender person by their birth name. They will knock you out. Do not call a transgender person the gender that society normally associates their birth sex with. So do not walk up to a transgender woman and say, What's up, dude? What's up, bro? What's up, man, guy, etc. Because that is still a six-foot male in a dress and high heels. 
and you will get your ass beat. Thank you very much. This is Fonzie Graziano, and I approve this message. And to close out this episode, it's time for Fonzie's Wisdom of the Day. Now, it's come to my attention that sometimes non-transgender people will change things about themselves, like their hair color, their eye color by wearing contacts, um, their name, in an effort to change who they are. Now, sometimes I can't tell if the reason I decided to change my name or to go by something different was because I was trying to run away from who I was or run away from what I was. But something that I've learned is that everywhere you go, you take yourself. It's not a lie. Whenever I went to New York to find myself, I realized that myself wasn't in New York And if I lost him here in Texas, no matter where I went, he was going to be lost. Now, I'm all for people dyeing their hair. I'm all for people wearing contacts. I'm all for people changing their name. But if you're going to change your name, dye your hair, or wear contacts, do it if you are changing those things for the fun of it. If it just looks cool aesthetically, if it just sounds cool, those reasons are fine to do. You go for it, boo. That's on you. But don't do it if you're doing it to escape the hair or the eyes or the name that you have. Don't claim to be something that you aren't. And don't try to avoid confronting the situation you were born into. If you do it because you're trying to change the fundamentals of your identity, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Beneath those contacts and blonde hair dye, you are still what you are. And that isn't to say that what you are and what you want others to perceive you as are always going to be different things. Make sure that the person that you want other people to see you as isn't what you created to avoid being what you really are. It is something that I learned, and it's something that I'm still learning. You can't change who or what you are. Your job is to accept that and to move forward with the strength that self-love and self-acceptance bring. With that being said, we've officially made it to the end of Ask Fonzie Anything. Thank you so much for sticking with me through this entire episode. If you want to hear more, I have tons of episodes posted already, and I'll post new episodes whenever I want. No, but seriously though, usually Mondays. And when the show starts growing, I'll start releasing episodes twice a week or something. If you like the show, it is available almost everywhere podcasts can be heard, including Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Make sure you add, like, subscribe, or follow me on my social media profiles. It's at Fonzie Graziano on everything, so you don't have to worry about missing an episode. Make sure and send me DMs to request episode discussion topics. You can write in to me if you need advice. I've been told I'm an infinite spring of wisdom. I can definitely give you an outside perspective. I'll tell you what I would do anyway. And who knows, your letter might be the one I answer in the next episode. Uh, If you like, you can directly support the podcast. There are links in the bio to my Patreon and Anchor Direct. Or you can just buy one of my books. My first book, Glory, is available in print on Amazon.com and Walmart.com. The ebook is available on Kindle. And there is an audiobook available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes.com, I think. But don't quote me on that. Also, my second book, Raindrops and Other Lullabies, which was originally due for release earlier this year, but it's been pushed back twice due to the coronavirus. It'll definitely be out before the end of the year, though. Uh, If you go to my website, not only can you download and read PDF previews of both books, but you can also listen to a sample of the audiobook of Glory, and if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get an exclusive updates on what I'm working on and promo codes and sales and discount info. And last but not least, I just want to remind y'all to be a rainbow in somebody's cloud, be kind to yourself and others, unless they talk to you crazy, and wash your fucking hands and wear your goddamn mask. I want to go to the bar. We'll get through this together. (laughs) Thank you for listening. I think you're pretty cool. I don't care what they say about you. Bye. Um... <laughs>
I got nothing. 